Welcome back from the lunch break. So we move straight on to the second session, which we are going to be talking about the future of tertiary education in Ghana with open artificial intelligence. And to help us with this, it's a man who, has a, who is a full professor in sociology and a Fulbright New Century Scholar of Higher Education. Between 2008 and 2016, he was a director of the Institute of Continuing and Distance Education, University of Ghana. And with the onset of the collegiate system, he became the foundation dean of that school. Prior to coming to Ghana to join the University of Ghana, he worked for 19 years at the State University of New York and California State University, both in the United States of America. He has a certificate in instructional design for online teaching and learning from the California State University and a certificate in e-learning ecologies, innovative approaches to teaching and learning for the digital age. In a span of three decades, he has acquired extensive international and multicultural experiences through study abroad, faculty, student exchange programs, conferences, and other professional engagements as a visiting scholar in his field with colleagues, organizations across four continents, Africa, Asia, Europe, and North America. He is the author of four books and has contributed several book chapters and has published extensively in high-impact international peer-reviewed journals. He was largely instrumental in the University of Ghana's adoption of the SICA Learning Management System, LMS, and has since been the training convener for faculty and has served as the chairman of the University's, University of Ghana's e-learning quality control committee. He has served as a member of the panel of assessors for Ghana Tertiary Commission, GTEC, Accreditation of Institutions and Programs, an assessor for faculty tenure and promotion at Indiana University, USA, Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario, Canada, Southern Illinois University, USA, University of Cape Coast, Wisconsin International University College, Ghana, and the University of Education, Winneba. He is an external examiner for PhD thesis at various universities, both locally and internationally. With a hand of applause, let's kindly welcome Professor Yao Ohineba Sechi to the days. <laughs> to join him is Mr. Patrick D'Souza. He's an accomplished professional in the field of information and communication technology. With over 20 years experience, he has established himself as a visionary leader and an expert in leveraging technology to drive business growth and information. As the director of ICT at the University of Health and Allied Sciences, he oversees the strategic planning, development, and implementation of information technology systems within the university community. He is known for his exceptional leadership skills and ability to inspire and motivate his team. He fosters a collaborative and inclusive work environment encouraging creative thinking and open communication. Prior to joining UHAS, Mr. D'Souza worked in an ICT leadership for several reputable organizations, including GCNet, Third Rail Ghana Limited, Standard Chartered Bank, and other companies. His areas of expertise include project management, system design and development, strategic plan, change management, information security management, quality management, data center build and management, vendor management, document and records management, team building and leadership, contract negotiation training, among others. He holds an MBA in logistics and supply chain management, another MBA in project management, a postgraduate certificate in business administration, and a bachelor's degree in computer science and physics. 
He's an old student of the Presbyterian Boys Secondary School, Lagos. Outside his professional pursuits, Mr. D'Souza enjoys spending time with his family and pursuing outdoor activities. He's also actively involved in community initiatives that promotes digital literacy and bridges the gap and bridge the digital divide. With, with his expertise, leadership, and passion for technology, Mr. D'Souza is driving positive change and empowering organizations in the tribe in the digital age. With a hand of applause, let's kindly welcome Mr. Patrick D'Souza, Director ICT US. Last but not the least, is a very fine gentleman. He's a fifth year Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery student who hails from Cape Coast in the Central Region. He's currently the SRC President for the University of Health and Allied Sciences. In his leisure, he likes to debate, read, hike, travel, and cook. I don't know which dish he knows how to cook though. Aside from volunteering with numerous non-profit organizations, he's also a tech enthusiast. In his early years, he introduced him to the hypertext markup language. As a child, he spent hours behind an old IBM which ran on Windows 2000 to help him develop his skills. Although originally from a front-end development background, he's passionate about data and machine learning. He is especially interested interested in how best to integrate modern technological tools, especially artificial intelligence, into the current educational structures. With a hand of applause, let's welcome Mr. Roger Mascot Lutrot, the SRC president for U.S. Without making much time, I'll hand over the mic to Prof to give us his presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. As they normally say, I normally don't say that, but as they normally say, I stand on the already established protocol. <laughs> oh, you won't respond? You have to say yes, you agree before I continue. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think you've all eaten well, so I'll try not to put you to sleep. Okay. I'm told that this is the day that the good old Lord has made. Actually, it started yesterday. No, let me go back. It started about three weeks ago when I got a call that if I'll be available to do a presentation here. I said yes before I <laughs> before I use my head I also said yes because it was coming from one of my former bosses Mr. Lucas Chigabati who I had worked with for several years but I also saw it as an opportunity to talk to IT professionals beyond the University of Ghana so I took up the challenge and today I am here uh, the title I was given to present on was The Future of Tertiary Education in Ghana with OpenAI Opportunities and Challenges. But you see that I've modified the title slightly to include possibilities. Okay. So, uh, in this discussion, which 
will be supported by my able panelists. Uh, we'll be looking at the context within which all of these things are happening. Then, as I indicated in the morning, we'll be looking at mindsets. <laughs> eh? And then, we'll be looking at a learning management system called Sakai Learning Management System that the University of Ghana uh, adopted. You hear more about that. Uh, don't confuse the name Sakai with my last name, Sechi. Uh, although some colleagues at the University of Ghana call me Professor Sakai, but I am Professor Heneba Sechi. If you remove the I, if you remove the Y in my name, then you get Sakai. Okay. So we'll be looking at that. We'll be looking at the challenges, major challenges and opportunity. I won't spend too much time on challenges because this morning we had a full discussion with the panel, uh, Professor Yirinchi and his team. So we'll look at more of the possibilities than challenges. We'll look at AI in general. We'll look at uh, open AI and then uh, MOOCs, which is Massive Open Online Courses. We'll look at Bloom's taxonomy, and then I will urge you to think about how you are going to make your mark wherever you are. So this is the contest. The world has gone through a number of revolutions. Some even believe that we are in the fifth revolution, but I'm not touching on that yet. So let's look at the four important revolutions, and this fourth industrial revolution is what we are going to be focusing on because the contest of learning management systems, AI, closed systems, open systems, enterprise, all of that is as a result of the fourth industrial revolution. The historical context of the fourth industrial revolution is that it builds on the third, sequentially, from the first, second, third, it builds on the third. And the third is what has been termed as the computer or digital revolution. This morning we heard a lot about digital infrastructure and digital skills development. It all started in the 1960s. Development of semiconductors, mainframe computers, networks, personal computing, and the internet. Uh, I'm not telling you how old I am, but I suspect that in this audience, I might be older than all of you. True? Maybe true, maybe false. Okay. So, when I went to the University of Ghana, there were no computers. <laughs> there were none. What we had were mainframe, big, huge computers that ran some data which we never understood. I was first introduced to computers in 19... By the way, I went to the University of Ghana in 1976. So I completed 1979 and did my national service one year at the University of Ghana, went abroad. You know. Okay, so my first introduction to computers and my first touch of a computer was 1984 when I started my master's program at the State University of New York. And I can't forget a date when I submitted my first assignment as a master's student. I thought I had a very beautiful handwriting, so I wrote very well on a yellow you know, sheet of paper, paper or papers, handed over the assignment. The professor took a few days, came back, gave us the results, handed the paper to me and said, well, what is this? Who did this? I raised my hand and said, well, my friend, he called me Yo, because the name Yao, he couldn't pronounce, so Yo. Yo, what is this? I said, that's, sir, that's my homework. He said, no. I asked you to type, and I told you the phone margins to use, the pigeonation. I cannot take this. I said, well, sir, but I don't know how to type. He said, well, that is your problem. <laughs> I said, well, but I went to the University of Ghana. They didn't teach me how to type. He said, still, that is your problem. So, well, in the university I went to, it was only ladies who typed. And all my long essays were typed on this typewriter. He said, no, those days are gone. And he told me something in August 19, 
84 that I've never forget. He said, Yao or Yo, if you want to do well, do it for yourself. Because in this country, there are no excuses. So you have to figure out how to come along and get along. From that day, I said to myself, as for me and my family, never again will somebody say these words to me. So from that day, I enrolled in a typing school with high schoolers, went to the basic computing classes with undergraduates, and took up a computer-trained engineer. No, I'm a sociologist by training, but my focus is on sociology of education and change management and development studies. So I'm telling you this story because uh, in the, uh, the computer and uh, digital revolution started in the 60s. I was in primary school. <laughs> and all the way till I was 28, I had never seen a computer or touched a computer. So what defines the fourth industrial revolution? Ubiquitous learning, mobile learning, cheaper, smaller, and more devices, AI, and machine learning. Smart factories, fusion technologies. You are all IT, well, most of you are all IT people, so you know all of these things, so I'm not going to bore you. But look at the profound changes that have happened. Digitization of everything. The speed of innovation and diffusion is faster than ever before. If you look at all the revolutions, it is the fourth industrial revolution that things keep changing, even within uh, seconds. It requires fewer workers to create a unit of wealth. Many businesses providing information goods that require very little storage. If as a country we still continue to rely on manufacturing, and rely on export of commodities, then we are way behind. These changes have brought about tangible innovations. Intelligent assistance and designers and architects mixing computational design. We have all the microchips, microcomputers, and everything in. Okay. Now, this is the question I want you to ponder on, and maybe during the discussion time, I want to hear your views on this. The fourth industrial revolution is here. Even the fifth has started. The question for all of us, institutions, industries, business, governments, is not whether we'll be disrupted. We have already been disrupted. So, when is the disruption coming? It's already here. What form will it take? We have to figure that out. And how will it impact all of us? In many, many ways, it is impacting us and it is killing some of us slowly and others are also jubilating. It's our responsibility as citizens in this country and as global citizens, we need to establish a set of common values and policy choices so that we'll be able to go through the fourth industrial revolution. But here are the statistics. 13, 1.3 billion people still lack electricity. You can imagine how many of them are in Africa. There's infrastructure, so you were made to understand the challenges beyond that. But what is limiting the potential of the fourth industrial revolution are two things I want us to be discussing seriously today. Leadership and understanding the changes underway. So if we are comfortable where we are to maintain the status quo, it means we are not understanding the changes and therefore we will not be interested in moving away from what we are used to. And if we don't have the right leadership, nothing will change. Because even if they have the resources, their priorities will not be making the necessary changes. Lack of a consistent and positive narrative 
to empower individual and communities to embrace fundamental changes should be underway. So, what is your mindset? Do you have a fixed mindset? Or do you have a growth mindset? And if you do, do you also have an innovative mindset? See, a fixed mindset says, well, hey, I am fine. I'm through what I have. Nothing will change. And even if I can't do it, no worry. I just haven't done it. So uh, let the status quo remain. That's a fixed mindset. The growth mindset says, well, it is possible. We can do things. But the growth mindset without innovation just stays there. The growth is very, very small and literal incremental. You have to have an innovative mindset to be able to think beyond the possibilities. But in the 21st century, in the fourth industrial revolution, we look beyond even the innovative mindset. What we have, or what we should be looking for, is the digital mindset. Because if you don't have the digital mindset, you continue to think, as I said this morning, the analog way. You will still be using the Etikopo TV, and you still be looking for other ways, and uh, <laughs> maybe driving shift cars in sort of uh, automatic. Uh, a friend of mine told me that if you don't know how to drive, is it shift? Is it called shift cars? Manual. If you don't know how to drive that, you are not a driver. I said, well, when I learned how to drive in the United States, there were no manual cars. So I wasn't you know, allowed to drive with manual cars. But I had to learn how to drive manual cars myself. So if you have an analog mind, then you are okay with driving manual cars. But if you want to develop a digital mindset, then it means you have to be riding automatic cars. And if you have money, you have to buy cars with sensors so that when you are <laughs> hitting an object or when you're about to hit an object, the sensor will tell you that. Then your odometer and all the systems will give you warning signs about your tire pressure, <laughs> about your light going out, about the things you need to do. All because cars have started thinking digitally. So cars, like many other machines we have today, are digital. So it's the age of data, algorithms, and AI. So a set of attitudes and behaviors that enable people and organizations to see how data, algorithms, and AI open up new possibilities and to chat a path for success in an increasingly technology-intensive world. That's what we all need. That's what our leaders need. That's what our vice chancellors need. And that is what our politicians need. And that is what community leaders need. That's what our children need. To do that, we have to think about two critical areas preparing the people for this new digital organization culture, and designing and aligning systems and processes. This morning, we heard a lot about systems and processes and how the digital infrastructure will help us move in uh, the desired direction. But how do you prepare people for a new digital organizational culture? Because if that culture is not there, then they'll keep on writing on paper and circulating the paper. They'll keep carrying file folders and these days, you see brown envelopes, uh, people holding them with their seed, CDs or CVs in them looking for jobs. But if you're able to create a year portfolio with all your accomplishments and achievements, you don't need to carry paper around looking for jobs. Okay? So that organizational culture, that community culture is what is lacking, and that is what we need to be doing. Now, if you also believe that the digital technologies will help you address higher level thinking, then you need what is called the Bloom's Taxonomy Digital Model, which will help you to use all these available technologies, all of which are free,
to be able to think beyond just the remembering level or understanding level and be able to go higher up enough to be able to be creative. This morning, we're also talking about resistance to change. And I mentioned that there's the adoption matrix. Teachers, learners, administrators, and politicians and others, how do they respond to digital transformations? There are four in this box here, as you can see. I want you to focus well, and then during the questions and answers time, I want you to tell us where you are or whether or not you see any of these people around your institutions and what are you going to say to them. Okay. There are the frustrated ones. <laughs> there are the oppressed ones. or They see themselves as oppressed. They are the indifferent ones and they are the inspired. As for me and my household, I've been inspired. I was inspired by my first experience and first encounter when I was abroad. And since that time, anybody I see, I inspire them. And today, I'm also happy to say that I see uh, two of, where are my UG people? Where is Togo? Yeah, to continue to work and be where I am. Yes. So why am I so fascinated about learning management systems? And what has this got to do with AI? Uh, by the end of my presentation, you understand why uh, I'm so fascinated and that I'm inspired. I mean, learning management systems, I think all of you, all your institutions are using learning management system. But my discussion today is not going to focus on the learning management system itself, but what it can do and what we are not been using it to do. And that's why the transformation uh, ought to happen. Okay. Uh, since we are all aware of learning management systems, I'm not going to spend too much time here, but these are some of the popular ones, and the ones that uh, the University of Ghana adopted in May 2014 is called the Sakai Management System. Uh, there are 10 reasons why we adopted Sakai. Uh, it was hosted, we have full ownership, it was hosted first by Longsight 2014. Sorry, technical issues here. Okay, we can still talk whilst they are facing the technical issues. Uh, the 10 reasons we had full ownership, uh, it was an open source, we were able to adapt it to our own, and then we had the power of community built by communities, uh, and then pool of knowledge of world-class universities that started the Sakai LMS in 2005. So the pioneers of Sakai learning management system included Oxford University, Harvard University, MIT, UCT, University of Cape Town, Cambridge University, UNISA, Stanford, Indiana, NYU, Duke, and Rogers. So we were inspired by these universities using this learning management system and then I piloted with it two years between 2012 and 2014. The university accepted it, and uh, the rest is history. But what I like about the system is that it empowers our ICT professionals to be innovative and do well. Okay. So, What are some of the things that our ICT professionals have been able to do? Now we have Sakai Mobile. We have other plugins, third party plugins. We also have incorporated. So tell us something, what is happening? And 
change a computer. Okay, so uh, the one thing that our ICT professionals were able to do to prevent students from cheating, just I think it happened last semester, uh, this semester, okay, when, uh, when they are taking tests, all search engines have been blocked or are blocked except the only one they are using. So they are not able to you know, uh, cheat on the test. So uh, that is uh, kudos to our I I ICT professionals. Uh, we also, it's cost control because it's open source and we don't have to pay proprietor fees. Uh, it has also been very, very helpful for us in our distance education program and it is useful for building community of learners and practitioners. Don't worry, if you miss anything, we can share the link with you so you get the full presentation. Sakai has an infrastructure, it has an architecture, it's built around five themes, information, content, assessment, management, and communication. So these are the five areas that uh, we have the Sakai network. Uh, the major activities, both ongoing as well as in the past, includes the training of faculty and students and administrators, course registration now. One of the other things that our IT professionals have been able to do, I think the last three years, is to link the management information system with the Sakai Learning Management System. So once students register, the information is directly translated into Sakai, and once you are in Sakai, you can also post your grades and do other things. Course delivery, assessment, online, and turn it in evaluation too. Okay. The institutional quality control is very important. This morning we had something about that. Any learner who engages in online education should have at the minimum an education that represents the quality of the provider's overall institutional quality. And any institution should have at least five areas of quality control. Are you praying or you are sleeping? Uh -huh. Your brain. Yes. So when our 31 year old boy was little, we take him to church and, you know, normally he won't sleep early the night before. He's playing his video games, doing all kinds of things. So when we go to church, <laughs> he sits by me, heads down. Nana, what are you doing? So I'm praying. <laughs> yeah. So he he will pray for two hours. <laughs> yeah. So what did the pastor say? Well, I was praying. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so these are some of the technical challenges. Unfortunately, I don't know if we have a backup. Pop one question up quickly, then we can do the exercise there. Okay. Should keyboarding be made? a core requirement in Okay, so send the microphone around. Yeah, keyboarding, typing. The reason why keyboarding should be made um, a requirement in Ghanaian schools because we, we live in an increasingly technological world. Like, we, we type literally everything. Um, and in terms of economics, things like time is saved. And you need to be a computer literate to literally survive in the world right now. So if, if, if you don't do that, then you are not helping the various students that you are trying to prep for the professional world. Yeah. Okay, so wh wh why is it that we know this, but we don't make it a requirement? Any 
Oh, see, let's clap for the IT guys. You know, we didn't give them food to eat for nothing. I see. All right. Yes. Oh, yeah, we should go on. I mean, look at those who are praying and just give them <laughs> the, the microphone. Yes. Yes, I think keyboarding should be part of the uh, schools because it's the new handwriting. Yes, so why, why, why don't we do that? Why don't we insist on that? See, the teacher in me is coming. I mean, I'm not too comfortable with the podium here. So let me just walk around and, yeah, okay. Hi, Prof. I was a bit confused with keyboarding. So somebody told me that uh, it is typing. So, but uh, I disagree because of the direction the world is going. If we want to use voice activation in most of the things that we do, you don't need keyboarding. So you can do voice activation. We have open AI. There's a lot of things you can do instead of typing. OK. So that's another perspective. Yeah. But, but so, so in your job, you don't type? <laughs> Hardly do you type. OK. Uh, 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 thank you, Prof. Um, OK, so my answer is with the last but one speaker before my friend here. Prof, I, I think that it is the curriculum development process. And we can also fault GTEC, Kabna is here in this, <laughs> in this business because we have um, processes that sometimes make it impossible to introduce um, new skills requirements into our development uh, uh, processes. Thank oh, you. you. Go ahead. Go ahead and talk. Yeah. Thank you. Um, talking about keyboarding, we are now m moving more towards mobile computing. So, if we are talking about keyboarding, are we talking Let's about the same quality that we have on the main keyboard, or we're just talking about the um, the smart devices? It's about the usage, making it possible for users to use the devices for the purpose is intended, and not really about whether it's keyboard or not. Again, the reason why we are not doing this, to me, is all about infrastructure. If you look at even basic education curriculum, um, you realize that um, digital literacy has been embedded in every aspect. But the issue is that you get to these basic schools and you do not have the computers or the infrastructure to be able to do that. Maybe if we want to make any change, we should be considering bring your own device. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, so, yes, the infrastructure is not there, it's not available to everybody, we agree. But now, one student, one laptop, zero textbooks, e-books. What do you say to that? Yes. We can't afford that. Uh -huh. it, it, realistically speaking, because one, like um, boss, one of the bosses sitting down said, infrastructure-wise, right? Like there are schools that are literally under trees. They are still under trees. There are schools that don't even have buildings to have even electricity. There are schools that people need to use canoes to get to. People need to trek. Uh, very, very odd hours to get to. So one student, one laptop, politically and, you know, uh, with, with a hint of populism, yes, it will get you votes, but you can't actually bring it to life right now. That's, that's, those are my thoughts. Okay. Uh, um, prof, it's already here. It's keyboarding is already with us. They are integrated into our basic school curriculum. So... It's already here. It's, it's going to be a skill that we will continue to need, uh, whether AI comes in or whether voice-activated commands comes in. Or, and we're still going to need printed books, whether we can afford to put digital devices in every school or not. We're still going to need both printed books and electronic devices. All right. Okay. So 
if we really want to compete with the rest of the world, we shouldn't wait for everybody to get access because we can't have that. We can't have that. Even in the so-called advanced countries, there are rural schools. Not every home has, you know, uh, they may have electricity, but not every home has devices. Not every kid is well enough or well endowed. There are people outside in the so-called developed countries that are poor. So, why don't we do some model schools so that, as Du Bois once said, the talented 10th, when they get it, then they become the innovators and the rest of us will enjoy. But if we say we can't afford it, well, maybe it's beacon. It's available free. From where? First grade. <laughs> Second grade, third grade. It's free. Yes, they may not have the computers, but even the whole village has one computer and they take turns, wouldn't they learn something? Yeah, one village. Prof. One laptop, yes. I know there's going to be a struggle, but then let's also consider this. They are using computers. When there's a problem with it, how would they know? even the, to troubleshoot, to get it solved so that they can use it. Who will be there in those villages? Okay, so what is your solution? <laughs> what is your solution? Awareness, because, training. Because, uh -huh. Training and awareness as well. But Before, there are no computers, so who, who, what are you going to use to train the kids? The, when you, are, you can get a sample to train them, but the, when the who is ready, then you just give it to them. <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, I, I see some more hands up there, so. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, doc, I think uh, in Ghana we have a problem with policy implementation. I don't even know whether we have a strategic framework in Ghana that guides us in implementing those ideas. I would like to know if you have. Yeah, I was saying that uh, we have problem with when it comes to policy. Thank you. I was trying to say that uh, no, let's go back to the presentation. we have problem when it comes to policy implementation. And then in Ghana, I don't know if we have in place uh, a framework that uh, guides us in implementing those ideas. Because, and also, Prof talked about uh, digital and analog mindset. And I think most of the people who have analog mindset are our leaders, the leaders that manage our institutions. Because I've, I had experience before. So a situation where maybe you're an IT expert and you try to come up with a brilliant idea that can help change or solve a problem within an institution. And the fact that your director or uh, manager bears analog mindset, it's very difficult for such proposal to be accepted. So what, what can we do to change the mindset of those leaders who still have analog mindset into digital? Well, Thank you. Uh, Rogers, uh, in his research about innovation, says there are going to be laggers no matter what you do. Leave them. They will die their natural death. But focus on the innovators, about 12%. Those who are the early adopters, work with them. The late adopters will be forced like COVID force all of us. Okay? The laggers, there are nothing you can do. But if you are going to wait for everybody to be an adopter, Nowhere in the world has it worked universally. So let's think through. This is one of the major challenges. And I see this with my students all the time. And it reminds me of my experience in 1984. A wahi, B wahi. I give them these free tutorials. Those who are willing, within two weeks, it works. Those who feel lazy say, oh, I'll let my children type for me. Well, when you're going to heaven, your children will not go with you. 
you have to be judged by your so it's a major issue when we are talking about digital mindset self discipline is not there you know technical issues like we just have but we've been solved okay so what is another thing that is a major problem facing us is this what 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 is this got to do with us oh pass the mic around i mean what is this deadlines huh? me, me, meeting deadlines while whilst we're avoiding excuses what is the problem with the people you work with are they always on time do they tell you it's uh, ganian time african time yes when i set deadlines in sakai sakai is not respect of a ganian or an african sakai time sakai time but we keep on thinking that somehow there's a ghana time we take our time to do things you know when it can happen it can happen if you don't meet the deadline you get excuses oh my car broke down oh i the rain was there falling you know i got in traffic it's part of the analog mindset <laughs> if you want digitization automation to work you have digital skills to work then the computers have to be measured So meeting deadlines is a major problem in our world. But of course our world changed and now we have pre-covid pre-covid most people were in the middle trying to do sorry pre-covid most people were on the blue side light blue covid forced most of us to be on the red side and post covid is forcing people to be in the middle which is the blended mode of learning but before we even get to the artificial intelligence world we've been living in recent years in the vuca world volatile uncertain complex and ambiguous that's the world we live in in the vuca world the graduate jobs outlook still very bleak you may finish school even with a degree in computer science and you may be struggling because if your degree in computer science has been all based on theory 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 and little practice businesses will not be interested in hiring you the fourth industrial revolution digitization and ai are combining against the background of a global pandemic of covid-19 and now we've added Russia and Ukraine. So in this VUCA world, what do we need? We need to navigate it and survive. We can't wait for the VUCA world to go away. So for many many employers, degree discipline is less important than one would think. So you finish a PhD, you finish a master's, BA, it doesn't matter. The low battery has come back again. Okay. It doesn't matter. Students will have to think out of the box and commit time and energy and not make any excuses so that they can work. But for higher education, a focus should be on rethinking and retraining our teachers and our administrators to be able to understand this VUCA world and do the needful. Let's clap for IT people. Ah, you don't clap for them. Okay. So let let me pass it on to my partner in crime to say some words on this world. Is your is your institution? Yes, I do. <laughs> and and you are the director of ICT. Yes. <laughs>
Yes, so you're welcome once again. Uh, I can see the food is taking a toll and the lunch is taking a toll. Um, so, um, uh, can we just rise up and stretch our limbs a bit? Just, uh, just where you are. Yeah. Uh, um, you know where the washrooms are, just in case you want to um, stretch your legs a bit. The washrooms are on the sides. So let's take about some five minutes, quick break, and then we continue. Thank you. So just uh, whilst you are exercising a bit, uh, there's going to be a cocktail dinner stroke party this evening at 6 p.m. A bus will depart here at 5 and get to Mirage Junction at 5.30 and wait there for a bit and it will take you to the venue. It's not close, so don't miss the bus. It's called the Breeze Bar. It's at other clue. So there's going to be a cocktail dinner stroke party this evening at 6 p.m. Okay, there's a condition. They said if only you come back and pay attention, then we'll go ahead with the cocktail. But if you don't pay attention, the cocktail is cancelled. Or oh, prof, I'm wrong. <laughs> prof, they beg. So please take notes. The bus will depart here at 5. Get to Mirage Junction, stay for a bit, and then depart to the venue. There's also a session on Saturday. To, there's also a session on Saturday to various interesting places. So please let's take note. The time the IMF World Bank Two is giving us something all the way through, and now and launch it. how it works. Most of the students already know they are in for quick fix. Quick fix. I gave an assignment last semester in my PAD class. <laughs> One group <laughs> had 91% AI index. And I asked them, they said, oh, we didn't, you know, use AI. I said, okay, fine. This is the evidence. Come and prove to me that you didn't use it. Then in the end, they say, oh, we use it small. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> Chat GPT is an innovation built on foundational developments. We can't run away from it. Is the foundational development is AI and machine learning and natural language processing. But the challenge for us in institution is the plagiarism and instructional design. So we believe that students are cheating. Why are they cheating? Why are they cheating? If they acknowledge the source, will we call it cheating? All right? AI is good for personalized learning, it streamlines time consuming tasks. Okay. But this is what Professor Mark Washaw had to say in March 2023. He sees a contradiction in AI. Okay. And you, technical people, you can tell us if you believe in this contradiction. He says, those who can best write with AI will be those who can best write without it. Because they will need to be able to write good prompts, evaluate the AI output, and edit the resulting text into a usable final product. Okay. So those who can write well, it's difficult to catch them. So you can distinguish between the legend student and the brilliant student. So don't be afraid of AI. It has come. It is here. 
He's been here a long time. It is with us. So we have to learn how to understand it. And those of you doing research into it, learn how to do it. And then explain the process because it's not going away. Because people are pumping money into it. Okay. Now, turn it in. It's the plagiarism software detection that uh, some of you know. Experiences. You are all has an AI to assess differently, how to teach differently, how to do things differently. All right. We need to do that, taking into account what is called the innovative approaches to teaching and learning and all the affordances that are available. We need to inspire our students to move from the three R's to the seven C's. Creativity, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, computational thinking, choice, and caring. The seven C's in the sense that without the seven C's, we can go far. And without collaborative learning, we can go far. One of their four dances is called collective intelligence. And collective intelligence means that we need to bring our heads together to solve a problem. In our world in Ghana, we are told look straight. They are not, okay? We are training them to pass exams, and if they pass exams, the whole area they have passed. I still don't understand why in our tertiary institutions we require somebody to have a credit in English, credit in math, credit in integrated science or social studies. Even if they have once in all the other subjects, if they fail any of these score, they don't go to university. Why? 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 So, you technical people have a lot to do with your lecturers and administrators. I told you, find allies. There are allies there who will agree with you so that uh, we will change the way teaching is done, the way assessment is done. Uh, I'm just saying this because I believe that we need to build capacity. And the way we build the capacity is to ensure that everybody who is able is on board. And don't assume that everybody will be on board. Not everybody will be on board. There will be the slackers, there will be the laggers, but let's identify the right people, build the capacity so that uh, they can move on. All right. Uh, one way that you yourselves can build your own capacity is through the massive open online courses. There's a virtual reality, I'm not touching on that. Of course, social media is there, online data collection tools, but my interest is in MOOCs, massive open online courses. Most of these courses are free, and you can, you can sign up for free, but if you have some little money and you want to uh, pay some token, you'll be able to get every course you need. Data science, data analytics, project management, all of that. As I speak to you now, I'm still in school. I'm enrolled in three MOOC courses in Coursera. Anytime I get five minutes here, ten minutes there. I go to class. The three courses I'm doing, uh, one, I have 85, 81% completed. Course is called Ye Learning Ecologies Innovative Approaches to Teaching. Another course, Get Interactive, Practical Teaching with Technology. That one, 8%. Introduction to data analysis using Excel, 7%. But I'm going. And there are more. I've already completed three okay, with certification. So you have to continuously build yourselves and encourage your colleagues to do the same. Uh, you can got a notice from the university, public relations, that Sakai has now 
or will be upgraded to the latest version 21.5. Koku, is that right? 21.5. And it has all these AI features. It is up to us to learn how to use them. Personalized learning, enhanced automation, LMS, data, statistics, analytics, pedagogy, which is the lessons tool to use to develop all your pedagogies, gamification, which is plugged in, collaborative tools, they are there, chat, discussion forums, flip classroom. You can set your lessons ahead of time, students to read even videos, podcasts, everything ahead of time, they come to class and discuss. Bloom's taxonomy compliance, which is asking students to be creative instead of just asking them to write tests. So we have e-portfolios built in there, wiki platforms are there, a blended classroom, LMS chatbots are there, outcome focus, video conferencing. Our LMS is linked to Zoom, Microsoft Teams. As we were closing up the first section, you know, you, some of you saw me sitting here. Uh, I was trying to log on to Zoom through Sakai to transfer my hosting rights to another colleague who will be teaching my class today whilst I am here. And they are on teaching. Mobile learning, our IT staff have developed UG Sakai Mobile. So you can have access to that. So all of these are in action. All right. So let's make the best opportunities for our training students. So, my takeaway. There are challenges, opportunities, more challenges and possibilities. The learning management system continues to evolve with the incorporation of AI and machine learning. Learning management system providers are exploring ways to personalize learning, improve course design and enhance learner engagement take the action needed, needed uh, and complain about your leaders. Complain about funding. But there's so much you can do. But the only thing you can move forward is if you do. I hear, I forget, I see and I remember. I do and I understand. Thank you. Again, I'm sorry about the, I wouldn't even say I'm sorry because I didn't create the problem <laughs> that I, all right. But thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Prof. Let's put our hands together for him at once. With this one, we would have the director of ICT also do a presentation before. So kindly jot down your questions. When it's time for question time and suggestions, you put it across. So I invite Mr. Patrick D'Souza to give us a presentation. Okay. All right, thank you very much. I will not go through all my slides. I'll skip a lot of them because uh, Prof has touched on most of them. So my presentation will be very brief. Hopefully very brief. Thank you. My name is Patrick D'Souza. I'm the director for, of ICT here in UHAS. Um, I'm from private sector, recently joined the educational sector. So pardon me if I'm not too familiar with things in this area. The future of tertiary education in Ghana with open artificial intelligence. That's the topic we have to discuss. And I hope you came with your questions prepared. Now, we know what AI is. We know what open AI is. 
Do we all know what open AI is? Open AI. Open AI specifically refers to an organization called Open AI. Open AI is a research organization that aims to ensure that artificial general intelligence benefits all of humanity. They focus on developing and promoting AI technologies and practices that are safe, beneficial, and accessible to the public. So OpenAI is an organization. Okay. Collaboration in their research. And they aim to avoid the concentration of AI power in only a few hands. And they strive to make AI accessible for public benefit and avoid potential negative consequences. Um, we've talked about chat GTP, so I'll skip. Tertiary education generally refers to education beyond secondary level. It could be called higher education as well. It could be called post-secondary education. In Ghana, we have diverse range of tertiary institutions. We have the universities, which focus on bachelor's, master's, and doctoral programs. We have polytechnics and technical universities that focus on technical and vocational education. And we have colleges of education which train teachers for basic and secondary schools. So we have GTEC. It used to be National Accreditation Board. Now we have GTEC that uh, ensures that uh, the space. So the significance of the topic, the future of tertiary education in Ghana with open AI. What is happening now? There's a debate as to whether to embrace or to restrict. There's a talk about students using chat GTP to cheat, to do the assignments, and that they are not going to learn, and that AI is going to completely undermine education. But I believe that if we put the right guardrails in place, um, we are going to see some massive transformation in our educational sector. So GTEC must ensure that they have the policy. <laughs> Doc, I said GTEC, I didn't mention you. GTEC must ensure that they have the policies in place to accept embrace uh, AI in our educational sector. Because I can tell you for sure, whether you like it or not, AI is here to stay. It's going nowhere. So we need to think ahead and develop the right policies. It was published two months prior to the pandemic, January 2020. Hey. Answers. So what they wanted to do at the beginning was to create a mirror forum so that students would actually ask on the official forum. Information from there is shifted to this mirror forum where Jill starts to answer. And then the TAs would monitor the mirror forum and then they try to provide assistance to Jill so that Jill starts learning. With time, Jill became one of the most effective TAs. She answered questions with 97% success rate. She answered them immediately, 24-7. She was so quick that the team had to actually put a time delay on 
the answer so that students don't get suspicious. However, as per the article, Jill and other artificial intelligence systems provide answers to frequently asked questions, repeated questions. However, they cannot motivate students, nor can they help them with specific step-by-step -step situations in their homework or coursework. But what Jill and others like Jill were able to do was to free the human beings, the other TAs, so that they can actually provide more face-to-face -face or more human contact assistance to the students. Ashok Gol, the professor that developed this, provided a very interesting talk on TED Talk. I'm going to provide that link in the description so that you can actually take a look and get some more information. The second example was also from Okay, Georgia, thank you. But this time it's from Georgia State. Thank you. So this essentially to demonstrate that it has been used in other institutions to assist students to give them the kind of feedback they need. So you don't have a few TAs responding to 2,000 students or 2,000 questions. A chat box or a, an AI deploy system learns and responds to students when they ask questions. And this is a positive way to use AI in our educational institution. So there are several benefits that AI can bring to the tertiary educational system we have in Ghana here. Higher education managers need to start discussing now how we can apply AI to enhance the teaching and learning in our universities, in our tertiary institutions. So it behoves on GTEC to start putting together some policies. So my last slide is food for thought. AI is here to stay. We can use it as a productivity tool or as some people are already saying, it's an opportunity to subsidize costs by replacing human capital. But I don't believe that human capital can be replaced. Okay, do we wait for policy from GTEC or do we embrace it now and start moving on with it? Is GTEC going to take forever to come up with a policy or policies guiding artificial intelligence or they are waiting for it to be universally used and abused before they come up with policies to guide its usage in our tertiary institutions? If we say students are plagiarizing, why are they plagiarizing? How can we use artificial intelligence in that area? Turn it in in April, released their AI detection AI. So they are using AI to detect AI. And that's interesting. Well, now AI is learning from its own errors, it's learning from its own uh, findings. Now, if we are not careful, what's going to happen is that AI is going to be feeding itself with wrong information and with time start believing that that wrong information is actually what is a fact. Okay, it behoves on us in the tertiary institutions to determine what is real and what is fake. And if AI systems grow to the point where uh, there is a debate as to whether the material being churned out by a AI is real or fake. There should always be a reference point in the tertiary institutions where we come back to and say, look, you should be the temple of truth. Between this and this, what it is? What is it? And this is why human capital can never be replaced by any man. Thank you very much, Mr. D'Souza. It's time for questions, contributions, and suggestions. So you kindly raise your hand up, they will get you the mic. But then I, don't, I think GTEC is really in trouble. Or you don't think so? Because everything goes to GTEC, GTEC, GTEC.
Dr. Techi, you are really in trouble, though. Really. Can I go? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, I'm happy that some of you are still here because this uh, really important stuff which we all must be interested in. I have two questions. The first one is, will AI not worsen an already bad divide situation? We already have digital divide, educational divide, economic divides. Will AI not worsen an already bad situation and how can we prevent this? The second one is, uh, should we consider oral exams? So you go and run your question through AI, it gives you a beautiful answer. If you are very creative and know how to work, I mean to write well, you should be able to edit it in such a way that no one is able to detect that you actually passed this through AI. But if you sit before your professor, they are able to ask you questions. How did you derive this? What was your basis for this? I mean, additional questions. Um, Prof, do we think this is feasible and advisable to, to pursue? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, those are two interesting questions. But, you know, before AI, there have been contractors all over this country writing theses, long essays, dissertations for people. Now, I'm going to link this to the viva we normally do at the universities. The essence of the viva is the oral report you're talking about. So, if you contrast somebody to do the literature review for you, for example, or do your data analysis for you, and you end up going through for one reason or the other, at the end, tail end there, at the Viva Fana oral exams, you'll be caught. But even in my department, we'll do what is called mock Viva before you even you get up to School of Graduate Studies. So during the mock Viva, there's a panel of uh, some of us to interrogate how you did it, why you did it, and then justify your inclusion. If we look at alternative ways of examination, I will include the oral exams. But there are other ways of examining learning outcomes beyond just testing, testing, testing. For example, uh, simulation exercises, case study, e-portfolio, things that you'll be able to show that you yourself were. cannot assume that human beings will not get assistance. People get assistance all the time. But if you get 50% assistance, are you able to defend the 50% that you did yourself. So the assistance will come in all forms. But we shouldn't also look at education as punishment. Those were the days when your teacher would say, I will get you when the exams come. Okay. And then when you do anything, you're afraid that you won't challenge your teacher because he will get you when the exams come. And then came the sex for grades scandals also. Uh, what we really haven't done well is design our curriculum in such a way that we have solid learning outcomes. And if we design the curriculum well, with clear objectives and serious learning outcomes, then the assessment measures will be based on the learning outcomes and it can go beyond testing. Uh, you know. So yes, I do agree with you. In fact, during COVID times, 
several institutions around the world, not only in Ghana, were doing not face-to-face -face exams, but they were doing other things, including uh, even theater, music. They will let you record your dance and post it. Okay? They will let you record your own music, your voice. And through AI, the voice recognition will recognize. That you, you do your own painting. So there are a whole lot of things. Even uh, simulation labs are there. Uh, we are not up to the augmented reality yet, so I'm not even going to mention it. But it is possible. So the human being has to find a way to be creative. And it is the teachers and the IT people here, we are linking the teachers to the IT professions. Because IT people cannot go alone, teachers cannot go alone. We need a marriage of the two. Whether we call it convenience marriage, or whether we call it arranged marriage, whether we call it a concubine age, it's their marriage. We have to have that marriage. And I've always advocated that in any IT setup, there has to be professional academicians there, or what we call academics, so that they will understand the technical side and the technicians or the technical people also understand the academic side. If you have that marriage, then we can put all these systems well in place and then we can make the progress uh, we need to make. But beyond what I've just said, let me also say that uh, AI is an emerging technology. AI is an emerging technology. Just like uh, when calculators were developed. Those of us who went to school when uh, we were, our age was determined by whether or not your hand can reach <laughs> your, uh, <laughs> your ear before you are you, determined to qualify to go to school. Well, when calculators were introduced, <laughs> what were the first? That mental, what, what we used to call mental, is going to be disturbed. Because now, if you can't calculate things with your head, and the machine is calculating for you, then you are not smart. But the mundane task of remembering one times one, two times two, two times, all the time. If you use your energy to do something else, which may improve. Printing press was the same. When printing press came, it was the first. Okay? Computers, when they came, <laughs> I, I recently saw a TikTok <laughs> a post where uh, an old lady, I'm sorry, I have to use it because this was the example. An old lady who was used to the old manual typewriter got a computer, and then, uh, you saw it, and then started typing, and then swapped the computer aside. <laughs> you know, uh, so these things are going to happen, but we have to be true to ourselves that we cannot sit down on concern. Yes, we didn't develop the systems. Neither did any one person or any one country or any one race develop the system. These are well systems. So when you look at the people working in any lab to develop these systems, there are black people there, there are Ghanaians there, there are Nigerians there, there are Chinese, Singaporeans, you know, Israelis, they are all over, Chinese, uh, you know, Russians. So we cannot sit down here and say, oh, we did not develop the system and therefore we cannot use it. We just have to localize it, adopt and adapt so that we can use the systems that are with us to solve our local problems. Uh, a typical example here is what happened, or what used to happen at the University of Ghana. All manner of cars and trucks used to pass through as a thoroughfare. Professor Yitia says, ah, all the roads are deteriorating because these huge trucks, so it was the bypass. Those of you who know the University of Ghana, okay, it was a by bypass for everybody. Or goes going to Jimpa, coming from Jimpa, Medina, Opunglu, they're all passing through. And even causing traffic congestion and bar roads. Provider said, no, we have to do something. And so management and council gave him the opportunity to go for a loan. 
as farted all the rows <laughs> and put AI at the gate. Okay. So, if you want to come in, you need to have your electronic pass. If you don't have it, you go and pay for it. Or if you can't pay for it, then you have to use the main road. Okay. Uh, so, it was a local problem. We found a local solution. With all the backlash that came around, our tow boot, the boot, the first one was demolished. I think even the second one was demolished. We were behind him. He said, well, we want this to be a university environment. Not every car should pass through here. If you think you have business to do, then go through the Pongre gate. So we intentionally left one gate open. <laughs> but the rest, close. Unless you have a chip embedded in your, your car, you cannot pass. So we need the technologies to solve local problems. And this is just one example of it. OK, so, uh, uh, so my question goes to Prof. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned that some of you caught some of your um, PhD students cheating. But you didn't tell us how you handled that. Because um, AI has come to stay. We have to understand that. But how do we use the, it responsibly? OK, that's a question. Another contribution I should have made earlier um, is the fact that we should also think about adapting computers in our schools. Um, last week, I spoke with some colleagues from Kenya. And over there, even at the primary level, they have made it compulsory as a national policy that they are primary kids who have my student. OK. I have an answer here for you. OK, so there were two groups. They were to do critical book review and first do a PowerPoint presentation about the books they review and then do a written report. OK. Turn it in. The report was 0% for this one group and 2% for the other group. But the Tenetian report that was 2% for the group, it turns out that the AI report was 91%. Okay, so this is what I did. I'm opening my mobile Sakai to give you the exact information or the report or the feedback I gave to the student. Okay, so. So this is uh, uh, the feedback I gave. OK. Hello, team two. 91% of your qualifying text in this submission is determined to have been generated by artificial intelligence, AI. Please check the link below for answers to frequently asked questions on how Tenetine's AI writing detection capabilities work. Okay, so I put the link there for them to find out for themselves. Then I said, nevertheless, your written report identified the key ideas in Chromex Conscientism, that was the book they were reviewing, covering introduction, biography, and content and conclusion, chapter by chapter. Your work will have been enriched further if you had considered the following respect to Nkrumah himself and raising of consciousness. Then I list the things that AI <laughs> report did not include. Okay. So they are to respond to this. Okay, one, 
his family background, upbringing, religious influences, his educational and personal experience in Ghana before and during and after his sojourn to the United States of America and his days at the Lincoln University in Pennsylvania and the University of Pennsylvania. These things were not captured in the report. Either AI did not know or chose not to. It all depends on the prompt they gave. Okay. Two, his exposure to racism and discrimination based on his skin color, African personality. Four, how will you evaluate Nkrumah's philosophical tries that attempts to reconcile African traditional beliefs and Marxist socialism? Five, analysis and discussion of the concepts of religion, education, and Africanity in the book Conscientism and the general article reading on Achimota School in Colonial Africa was not mentioned. Because I had given them an article to read about Achimota School. AI, they don't know anything about Achimota School. Or they did not prompt AI to come up with any information on Nkrumah's link to Achimota School. Okay. So after I have read the report and I've uh, read the AI, AI query, I raised issues that the AI testing did not raise. So they had to go back and answer this. Okay. But even before uh, the AI detection, I had always told my students that I don't ask them Googleable questions. I ask non Googleable questions. Questions that when you Google, you won't find the answer. So in this very class, last semester, they, they, I, I, it was about philosophy and theories of adult and uh, continuing education. So they read about the Western philosophers, they read about African philosophers, they read about Afrocentrism, and asked them to write their own philosophy. They struggled to begin with them, but I gave them a template. So use this, write your own philosophy. And part of the assignment was, go back into your family, in your community, look for somebody who went to a colonial school. And I had given them the list of all the colonial schools that were opened by the missionaries and you know, what they were and how that might have influenced their religiosity up to now. <laughs> okay. So it is, it is difficult to think outside the box, but it's also very easy to draft simple questions for them to answer. So if you make it a little uh, non googleable then when they Google or they ask AI, AI may not find the answers for them. Okay. Uh, I, I, I bought a, you know, AI uh, chatbot myself and <laughs> had uh, been practicing with it. Uh, you know, uh, um, let me sh show you, I'll read to you something that, <laughs> very interesting that, uh, uh, I wanted to know if uh, I knew anything about myself. So I asked, who is Professor Yao Hinebasechi? Uh, the answer is buried somewhere there. I, I don't want to waste your time. But it w went on to pull out all my information from the U.S. And didn't include much about what I have done in Ghana in the last 15 years. Why? Because as this morning we heard, we don't have enough of our presence okay, on the net. Because AI is aggregation of data from you know, so many databases and pulling together. So in the end, what the AI said was, uh, for current information about Prof. Hinbasech, look at other sources. Okay. So, that's how I handled my students. I didn't, tell, I didn't say they cheated. I said they used AI, generated text. And I pointed to them with the evidence. So if they had any challenge. They would, but uh, they, they, it was a 10-point assignment. I gave the group six for effort. 
But I also raise all these queries. They are supposed to answer these queries so that uh, they can get their re grace released because their grace are now locked. <laughs> Until they answer these queries, they can see, you know, uh, their final grace. All right, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, my name is Solomon once again from Ghana Institute of Languages, Unimark IL. Um, we are talking about AI, and I want to um, thank Alan Thierry for coining the name AI, and also to all protocols observed. To I'm happy to see the father of internet in Ghana around. Yes, my question, question number one goes to Prof. Prof, could you please um, schedule some training program on e-learning for technical staff across various um, tertiary institutions in Ghana, maybe on some pro bono basis. Now, my question number two is like, um, is it talking about AI? It looks like at the tertiary cycle, we are focusing on plagiarism and the students and the students. But um, you bear with me that when you give, um, ask students any question, most of the time, the question you ask as a lecturer is online. So we are not looking at the lecturer I mean, dabbing the things online and going some PowerPoint presentation and go and talk and go. Now, the student also goes the same online where you've gotten your information and has brought you answers. You said the student is something. So, is it possible that with the inception uh, and uh, the growth of AI, artificial intelligence, and intelligent agents, is it possible for universities to change the dynamics um, of grading students? Because from my research, AI, to beat AI, I mean, the focus is going on critical thinking and nothing else. So is it po possible we look at um, critical thinking rather than setting these um, questions here and there and the students go and also research and bring us answers and becomes an issue? we change the dynamics? Then my final one, which is number three, is can we push for a non-political Silicon Valley-like technology hub in Ghana, a workable one, a venture that will help the country harness resources using AI to solve national problems? Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me just also add my question quickly. Then. Uh, the conversation of AI is broad, and you realize that uh, in fourth to fifth industrial revolution, data is gold. Unfortunately, the Galamse pits are all taken away. So data is what is the gold now, and most of us who are in tech must take the advantage of this era to see data as good. So AI is dependent on data. And the data warehouse is where the AI is mining from. So there are conversations around deep learning, giving birth to machine learning, then AI. And the amount of data you create as content is what is mined in all this. As far as we are concerned in the educational economy, from Africa down to Ghana, where do we stand? Oftentimes, I see this as uh, a, a tech takeover, a tech war, because we leave a lot of uh, creation to the developed world, and we tend to consume. And so most of the things we find AI is giving us as answers are based on what they, they gather as data or information on their side. 
just like Prof rightly said, when they Google his name, they can only find things he did in 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 uh, U.S. Why not things he did somewhere in a, a village in Obuasi or something? I mean, we don't have, we are not creating enough data which can be fed into this AI so we can have an Africa-centered result from the AI. And so I, for me, my is a suggestion that where instead of uh, introducing soft skills like uh, keyboarding skills, as Prof uh, advocated in, earlier in his earlier presentation, we should begin to introduce for tech enthusiasts and people who are in, uh, into computer science and others to learn more in deep learning, machine learning in AI. We should begin to introduce courses uh, in these areas at master's level, degree levels, you, because you cannot find much. Oftentimes, if you want to pursue these courses, uh, the best bet is to go to the advanced economy. If we can also start changing the narrative gradually uh, in our own African economy, I think we can contribute to the success of AI, which will reflect uh, African impact. Of course, we have the we have not only the father of internet in, in, uh, in Ghana, but in the whole Africa here. And I'm sure this is as his husband. He, he is passionate about things like this. And I'm, I'm very sure he's doing things in this area. So it's just a suggestion if we can work in that area. My question now is how do partnership between educational institutions government agencies, technological companies facilitate successful implementation of open AI in Ghana education system. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll start from your question about partnership. As it is today, we in higher education have not even started the conversation on what we can use AI for. I said earlier in my presentation that we need to identify the opportunities that are bound and to which we can apply AI both in uh, to the students and to the lecturers in, in delivering uh, teaching and learning. We need to start that conversation, come up with the opportunities that AI can be applied to, and then at that point engage the industry to start pro 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 providing the systems to address those issues. That conversation at the higher level has not started within the higher educational or tertiary educational institutions, and that conversation needs to start. And I believe that it is one of the reasons why um, Ghana chose this topic as one of the topics for discussion. I chanced upon uh, a webinar that uh, UPSA also held about a uh, few weeks ago on, a, on the same uh, open AI in tertiary education. I've chanced upon uh, a research document by two gentlemen from University of Cape Coast on the same matter. There's not enough information, there's not enough discussion on the topic, and we need to do that. Then identify and go to GTEC, again, GTEC, to lead us to get industry players to design systems that we can use to optimize our teaching and learning. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> well, training. Who asked for training? So somebody asked about training. 
Oh, he left. Okay, so if he left, then the question will not be answered. <laughs> uh, oh, you are. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, yeah, training is, is, is always good. Uh, at least <laughs> there will be a reason to be trained. But for maybe a couple of years now, I've told people who asked me to do training, say, well, I would, yes, I've done enough training. So if I'm coming to do training, I have to do it of specific learning outcomes. In other words, I won't come and do the training and go away. You have to show me evidence that you've been trained and that you have worked and that you have received. So during COVID, uh, I introduced a new system of training for our learning management system. So well, this time we're going to do training, but we're going to do the training at three levels. We've been doing training, training, training. People don't take the training, or some people don't take it serious, and they don't show the results. So this time around, we're doing it at three levels. And at each level, you'll be certified. And in order to be certified, you need to complete X number of assignments, which will be graded before you get certification. So we did three months training, intensive, one we started at the basic level, one month. So if you believe that the tools at the basic level, you already know, you don't want those tools, stay home, wait till the second month when we do the intermediate, and then wait till the third month when we do uh, the advanced. So some people started from beginning, got into intermediate, and got advanced. By the three months, they had gotten all the training and they have been certified. So, if that's what you desire, I am willing and ready to put a package together. And then, you have to come up with people with digital mindsets and analog mindsets by ready to be transformed from analog to digital. That way, we can meet them halfway. A training that will meet standard. You know, until COVID, if I detect, I must say, if I may be wrong, does not or did not um, recognize anything from online certificate. Uh, I may be wrong. Jitek, please forgive me, you know. Okay. <laughs> Right, so if we have to go e-learning, I think that we need to look at how to standardize it so that it will be accepted. And so I believe, since you are an authority... Oh, I'm, I am, I'm just me, I'm not an authority. <laughs> you are an authority, so you will be able to give us the direction as to how to go regarding e-learning. Okay, I, I, e -learning. I, I can give Thank you some you. ideas. Uh, I can give you some ideas. In fact... Uh, don't put too much burden on GTEC. I will defend them to some extent because I'm also a GTEC assessor panel. No, no, you're right. I, I was even telling Evans uh, I was going to critique, but now that it has come up, I'll critique it here. You know, she is my nephew, so he'll forgive me. Uh, we're talking about paper. This morning, we're talking about paper, paper, memo. Why not uh, uh, the, uh, electronic transactions? And I said, well, GTEC is guilty of that. When GTEC wants to go for you know, accreditation exercise or uh, assessment exercise, 
they asked institutions to get a big conference room, <laughs> spread the files of all people who have been appointed, call syllabus, uh, policies, everything, paper, paper, paper. Okay. So one of my programs that I put in place at UG uh, it's a master's program, master's in distance education and year learning. It's called DEL. We had run it five years, and it was up for reaccreditation. So GTEC wrote to us, said, well, we are coming. I said, okay, you can come. I said, okay, what do you need to do? Oh, the issuer letter. We need all these documents, hard copies, sent to assessors, then when they come, I said, well, we are not producing hard copies because we don't have them. <laughs> the documents you are looking for are in the computer. So we will send them electronically, and then when the panelists come, we will open up Sakai and show them. Because for how we delivered the course, the evaluation, the lessons plan, the lessons, they are all there. I can't print all of them. Grading, they are all in the system. <laughs> so finally, they agreed, and they came. And we passed, <laughs> you know. So, so if, you, if indeed you have done the work, and the, the problem is sometimes the online system is not the problem, but the people who do the delivery. Yeah. During COVID, some of my, my uh, colleagues were using WhatsApp, and they call it online learning. They were using just email, they call it online learning. Oh, how did you receive the, oh, I, I asked the students to WhatsApp me the answers. There is no trail of that, okay? So, it is how you train yourself to do the work, and it's not an easy work, because you can't just come unprepared and think that you come and tell stories and the class period is over, because it is based on not only the classroom, uh, one hour or two hours, but it is 24-7. Because you design your course in such a way that it is available anytime and work can be done anytime because it's self-paced. And of course, when assignments are due, they are due. So the training we are, I'm, I'm talking about here is training in course design, in instructional technology, in assessment and facilitation. So the technical people, I'm not sure what kind of training that as a professor I can give them, but if they want to be trained, uh, Lucas is here, I think Lucas knows about uh, uh, three of your, your people, well, of course, at, as, as when you were CITO, got trained under me. They took the masters in distance education and year learning. So they were able to understand what the instructor is able to understand and do. Okay. Uh, one was in HR, trying to remember his name. Then one became the IT guy for graduate school. Then Alaji. Okay. Then Equal. Equal, Equal also took yeah, the class. So four. So I trained them, and now, is anybody here from Ghana Communication Technology University? You from there, okay. You know uh, Justice Quay? He's your colleague, okay. I trained him. He came and did the DEL, Masters in Distance Education and Year Learning, okay. So if it is that kind of training, it's a master's program, but I can tailor it down from one year to uh, maybe six months, depending on how deep your pocket is, so that uh, we can work it out. Yes. Because I, I, I have to bring my team, I have to bring my head into it, I have to bring my stomach into it, and uh, yeah, but it, it, it's workable, because I, I've done it, uh, and I continue to do it, okay. Now, the other question you ask is about
Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. So, uh, as I said, uh, go back to this first then. Okay. There's a link here, and this time I hope it works. Okay. Uh, AI powered learning management system is the future. I said it earlier on, but I wasn't able to show the link. Uh, so, whatever learning management system you are using, you have to ensure that the tools that are in there are well utilized. Because they have, all learning management systems have similar tools. They said that the names may be different and the functionalities may be different. But if you're able to understand, as an IT person, if you're able to understand how the tool works, then you will need a little bit of instructional design technologies to understand how to use the tool. Okay? Because the tools are not just tools. They, are, they may be just tools for you, but for the teacher, they are tools for teaching. And for the student, they are tools for learning. So you have to know the pedagogy. You have to know uh, how to create the analytics. You have to know how to set up for personalized learning and the enhanced automation, gamification, collaboration, flip classroom, all of these video conference. And you need to know all of that. Okay. So I'm going to show you uh, my typical Sakai course site and show you how all of these tools I have utilized them over the years. As I said, Sakai, I started with it in 2012. So it's what, 11 years now since I've been doing Sakai. Uh, that's here. But I've been doing year learning for over 20 years, you know. And uh, I've been dealing with various learning management systems. And Sakai is the latest one. I've dealt with Blackboard, Moodle, uh, WebCity, QL, you name it. Okay. So, this is okay. So, this is a, a typical site. It's one of my core sites. Okay. So you see the sessions. All the sessions there are lessons tools. Okay. So if I open one, you will see how the lesson had been planned. Okay. So. An instructor needs to plan the lesson. You can't just, in the middle of the semester, say, this is what I want to do. You have to plan it the whole semester. Okay? And put even the deadlines for things to happen, all of them to happen. Okay? So these are the tools. Now, you see Zoom there. Okay? First one, you see syllabus there. The course syllabus is posted. Okay? It's there. It's your Bible, it's your Quran, it's your Torah. You use it all the time. And you can revise instantly and repost. Uh, next to it is uh, the Zoom link. So Zoom is, is it's embedded in there. So you don't have to create a, Zoom, a new Zoom account because it's an external tool which has been embedded okay, in Sakai. So once you are in there, you can do all the things that uh, Zoom will allow you to do. Then these links are all lessons. Okay, so you scroll down. Okay, okay. So scroll down. There's the assignments tool. There's the lessons. Okay, then... Uh, okay, hold on. Assessing year resources. That is also good for the librarians because UG BAM Libraries link is here. <laughs> so you don't need to go to a library. Once you're in Sakai, the link is embedded in there. You click on it, the whole BAM library and its external connections get available to you. Uh, there's the calendar there. So I'll scroll down. Let's see. Resources, discussion forum is there, tests and quizzes, scroll down, grade book, okay, continue going, drop boxes there, chat room, okay, email archives, UG library systems again, okay, and then site info, rubrics, messages, statistics. And this statistics gives you information about every student. How many times they have gone to a site, how many times they have opened a folder, when they submitted the assignment, how many times they are late 
in submitting the assignment, how many times they were very close to the deadline. <laughs> you have all of that. Okay. There are wikis for collaboration. Uh, scroll down. Okay. Commons, there's the polls. So when you have all of this, then as a, an IT person, you need to know how each of these tools work so that you'll be able to guide the instructors or the lecturers how to use these tools effectively. Because online learning is not just putting reading materials online <laughs> and then saying, go and read, or putting slides online. The interaction that needs to take place, which is called the facilitation, there's a lot. Okay. You need to engage them every day. Even if they are in Zoom, you have to make sure that have, their presence is fair so that they don't just log in and log out because there's always activity that you need to plan for them. Okay. So this is uh, a typical site. And as I said, Sakai has upgraded now. We started at uh, version 12 in 2014. And just today, the 21.5 uh, 20, version has been released, and UG has signed up for it. I think on the 26th or so, Sakai will shut down for them to upgrade to the new version. So as each version comes, it comes with new features, and it's up to us, either the IT people or lecturers, to learn what is new in the new version. But this new version is powered by AI. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. We'll take the very last contribution or suggestion question. See, the issue of uh, non-political is very, very important. It's, it's the centerpiece of all our systems, whether it's education, health, even road network. We should, as a country, believe in ourselves and be guided by principles of honesty, integrity, and the love for country, not by political manifestos. That's my view. When I go to the polls, it's me and my poll and my God. But when it comes to development issues, especially when it affects uh, all of us, we should look at the national interest. When COVID came, GTEC did not have a policy on online teaching and learning. So what GTED did was ask institutions to develop a policy to be shared. And I was a member of the committee that developed the UG online teaching and learning policy. So we submitted a draft to GTEC, and as an institution, we work it out ourselves, got the feedback, and then now it's a policy. Just last uh, November 2022 is when the University of Ghana got an official policy on online teaching and learning. Although we had the ICT policy before, we had all other kinds of guidelines in the system, policy for plagiarism, policy for tenanting, but there was no single policy on online teaching and learning. Now we have one. What is also interesting is that UG at 75 has not developed one single policy on teaching and learning. 
Why? Because we had documents scattered all over the place. So again, the university has asked some of us on the committee to develop a new policy for teaching and learning. So we are linking the existing policies to this new policy we are developing. I think we have two more meetings and then we will finish with uh, the policy for the provisi. So I can absorb GTEC on the issues of policies because I don't think there are enough hands there. They mostly rely on consultants, but maybe Evans will speak for himself. <laughs> Yes, I know GTEC, we take a lot of flack. It's normal. We are your regulators. So it's a love-hate relationship. Um, you mentioned something about online certificates. Please let me take this opportunity to educate us on certificates values. The GTEC at no point has said or issued a statement that says that we do not recognize online certificates. What we don't recognize are certificates from unaccredited institutions. So if you undertake a program from a platform that has not been quality assured and accredited and properly certified, it is the same as undertaking a program in an institution where the program has no accreditation. That certificate has no value. The onus lies on you. There are a lot of people, when we did the staff audit for the technical universities and even the universities, there are a lot of people who did certifications, who had PhDs from institutions that were certified, recognized from online platforms. Whole Technical University is a good example. Had a few. None of them were downgraded. The value of a certificate for purpose, every certificate has a purpose. So you go in and they take a particular program, for example, MPhil toxicology, then, or, uh, and then you come back into an institution. Yes, your master's is a research master's. However, it is in the field of toxicology but if you read through the logic of that submission, you would find out that it says that this program is for persons who are interested in working in the field of applied chemistry for industry. And on the basis of that, if GTEC comes to conduct an audit and finds you teaching or not in a lab, we will raise questions as to your validity of your presence in the teaching space. You have to appreciate where we come from, the logics that inform our decisions and the policies. When you come at us, I'm glad Prof is saying something about policies. Some of these issues are coming up as we all evolve. And so as we work on it, of course, when COVID hit us, we don't have the numbers. We, we rely on the expertise of our stakeholders to help us develop. As a country, until 2018, we didn't have a policy on higher education. Did they stop us from having universities? Did they stop us from having efficient, quality universities? My certificate is from 2000 and is it four or three from Legon. Is it not valid because we didn't have a policy? No. Sometimes we overemphasize the, the need for documenting these policies, but the real thing is that we need to get the job done. That aside, when it comes to the digitization, please understand. So in the morning and even now, we've mentioned the thing about the digital minds, the analog mindsets. And I was having an, a discussion with my uncle, and I pointed out to him that on the GTEC side, we are very comfortable going digital. As we speak, a lot of the lecturers, if you ask them, have applied to become assessors for programs. They'd initially, you write a letter, now they fill a form online. 
and then they are impaneled online. But some people still live in the old mindset where they still insist that they must be given the hard copies. In that instance, the assessor, the consultant you have taken on to do the assessment says, he, most cases, is the only aspect. In the whole country, we have only one maximum. Is it that those surgeries, surgeons who do the facial thing, maximo something? They, what, maximo? Yes. We have just about two. So imagine UDS wants to run such a program. The man is 70 years old and insists that he wants a hard copy. Are you going to insist you give him a digital copy? Let us be realistic, brothers, sisters. We are in a dynamic environment. The GTEC tries to stay abreast with the times. But sometimes we are a bit delayed uh, because of our funding challenges and other stakeholder influences. But whatever be the case, we always go back to the institutions like COVID. We, did, we knew we didn't have a, na a national uh, online policy. We went back to them and said, look, you are going to implement this. Give us how and what you think you will do in running your own online spaces. And we will now measure you to them. Tell us what you said you will do. I come in and I check. You said you were going to make sure that everybody logs on at 6 o'clock. Did everybody log on? So Legon's own is easier to, to check. The other institutions engaged different forms of MOOCs, and they all worked. Tell me who, how many of, how many of you don't have relatives who graduated in the COVID era? Are their certificates not valid because we didn't have a national policy on uh, online teaching? Then in that case, NGTech should say, tell you that we don't recognize those certificates too because they were online. But that's not the case. Online certificates have always been valid. It is the source, the quality assured and certified credibility of the source of those certificates that has always been questioned. Thank you. We'll take the last one. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, two quick issues, uh, of course, comments. One is about the the AI, I think uh, we can stop talking about policies, unfortunately, because we need policy to guide what we do. So we can stop. I think most of our universities, and that's how can we check them to ensure that we meet at least the criteria and have the minimum like similarity index. But as most of us don't have policy on AI, how much is allowed? And it's something that we, we have to start talking about. How much a, AI we allow in a thesis, in a project work, in an assignment, must also be determined by policy. That's very important. I ran a test just about three days ago, and the AI was about 72%. While the uh, plagiarism was about 16 <laughs> So contradiction. So why my university policy is that you must not explain 90% for plagiarism, but AI, there's no policy. So I was drawing the person's attention that <laughs> I'm even more concerned about the AI because the person <laughs> has done a lot of machine work. So we need to start that conversation. Then the other point is uh, on the use of the learning uh, models. I think from my experience, University orientation has become monotonous. Sometimes we orientate students and faculty. It's, it has, it's not a ritual thing. But I think now that we are bringing new things, we should spend more time on this orientation. Because some of the students are still struggling in the use of these learning uh, systems. So most of them are still struggling. I, I've seen students even depend on their friends to assess their portals and get assistance systems. I've seen a lot. I'm waiting for my friend to even assess their academic records. I want my friend to print my records for me. I've ever seen some of my staff even depend on their friend to print their piece list for them. They don't even know the procedure to assess. They say, how, how can somebody print your piece list for you? I don't know. So I think that 
we should have this in mind as we are using this instance, that the people who use this instance need more orientation, more training. Let's not take that for granted at all. People at different levels. And a regular orientation that we should have for them, can we have some computer-assisted tutorials on our websites that those who are slow in learning can go and practice this more and more and get used to it? I'm sure it will help. It will make the system more efficient. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I said that was the last one because we are far, 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 far. Thank you for giving me the opportunity for the very last one. <laughs> um, so most of us are IT directors, head IT uh, units and all. And AI is coming. It's coming large. It's obvious that none of us in the room has anything much against it. But we have to support the academics to utilize AI in the proper proper in quote uh, way. What are your suggestions on how we, the leaders in ICTs, are supposed to position ourselves, prepare ourselves in order to drive this in our traditional institutions who do things the traditional ways? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe that that conversation has started and it must continue. And then I'll throw it back to Dr. Evans and his team. GTEC has to drive this because whatever we come up with, they will have to accept before we can implement and they need to create that framework within which we can operate. They need to come up with the policies. So GTEC will have to lead the way by guiding the tertiary institutions to develop something that they can then run a policy around and then we, we move it up from there. If we want each institution to do its own, um, I don't know how that will play out, but I believe that if GTEC gives us a framework, we can work within that framework and it will help them also develop the policy for it. Otherwise, we will embrace it and run with it. And before they come and give us the, the uh, rails to guide us, we may have done beyond what they could, they could stop. So, uh, Dr. Please, you understand. Thank you. Yes. Uh, in the meantime, that we are waiting for GTEC to do its magic. As technical people, as instructors, we should also be reading around. But there's a lot of information online. There's a lot. We should be reading around to understand ourselves uh, how these transformers, especially the generative, you know, transformers, how they are, they are, they are, they are working. I don't need to understand the code. I don't need to understand uh, the computer language, but I should be able to understand how it works and how it affects my teaching and my learning. That's all what we can do. And then let the scientists go to the lab and do what they do best. I mean, I, I don't have to have a knowledge of how Android phones are done. But once there are applications on here, I should be able to enjoy the applications. I have my Sakai mobile here. I have a, a chat GPT here. My banking, everything is here. That's all what I need because they are made for me to enjoy my life. They are made easy for me. So the same way that uh, 
you know, open AI had been made or had been developed and launched for our comfort and benefit. So we shouldn't shy away at all from trying to understand. Okay. I'm sure by the end of the year, chat GPT will have even evolved into something else. So in one of my slides, I simply said, the future is unknown. The future is unknown. So what we know now is what we're dealing with. But to predict the future of tertiary education in Ghana with open AI is anybody's guess. What I can say comfortably is that learning management systems have come to stay and they have been improved and AI tools have been embedded in them. We need to learn how to use them effectively to teach and create better learning outcomes for our students and go beyond the simple testing, one final exam, 70%, one IA, 30%, then the student passes. No, every week there has to be something. Every week there has to be an assignment, both individual and collective, so that together we can develop ourselves and develop the next generation. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. With a hand of applause, let's thank our panelists upstage. And we will invite Professor Queen to round everything up and give us a short message. Let's put our hands together for him as he comes up. Please clap till he gets here. Actually, I'm just surprised. I thought I could sneak in and have a quiet uh, tune in to the discussions that are going on. And, but I appreciate that uh, you thought I should say something. Um, I've enjoyed the discussion. This is a conversation we should have. And I'm pleased that uh, roughly maybe two, three weeks ago, Academy of Arts and Sciences, um, uh, who I represent with respect to Garnet, also had a series of conversations around the AI and uh, education and the technologies. Now, there are a number of issues that come to mind. You know, uh, there are issues around use, okay, which is a lot of the discussion we are having, chat GPT, we are using somebody's product, okay? And it comes with its own biases or whatever, but we accept it and we try to control what it does. So that, that's one bit. So with that one, we are in a race of who has and who doesn't have, right? I mean, teachers are running and students are running, everybody, you know? Okay. So we have to figure out how to, in some sense, balance that race. There's a race to get the benefit of whatever these generative things are. It's nothing magic, but it does the nature of the problem. The second thing is that there's pressure for us to correct the biases of the existing tools, right? Because you don't have your own, you're using somebody else. He has trained it on his people. He did not train it on you. So there's pressure, okay, to either correct his or create your own. There's fear around the abuse okay, of such things. If I can, through um, a generative something, take your video or somebody's video and plant your head on it and tell certain stories, right? Because that's the AI doing those things. It will create concerns. And it leads to corruption, all the areas that, uh, of the negative things we don't want. Now, it also, uh, on the generative side, the use, I mean, leaving the use side, on the creation side, you have a big problem that technically we don't have a good solution yet. The AI is not good at explaining himself. Okay? Yeah, he gets the answer. But is he going to show you the weights that he used to get the answer? How is he going to explain it to you? So it's not, it's not as visible in some, to some extent and that creates fear. <laughs> you know, it creates fear. You begin to imagine there will be singularity and machines will take over and so on. The only thing I can show you is that in computing science, we have limits 
on what we can create. Okay? You cannot create a machine that will tell another machine halts or not. We can't. We can prove it to you every time. You cannot create a machine that will always tell you that some statement is fake or true. You can't. It is the decision problem on Chai Dong problem, they call it. And the other one is the halting problem. So, so we have limits on the science as to what we can do. We should assure you that if you have not instructed a machine, it's not going to be able to do those things. So if you're a bad person and you instruct it wrongly, then the law will deal with you. But if it's a mistake, raise your hand. Then we all join and help you solve it. So in essence, we can, we can tame the animal. <laughs> we can tame the animal. But if, if, if we don't do anything, then we won't be able to tame the animal. So having the conversations, internalizing it, and figuring out the different ways by which we can uh, include it in our life, uh, we can be successful. That's what I can say. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very, very much, Prof. Kuyinu. On that note, we've come to the end of today's activities. But before that, I'll make this announcement again that there's a cocktail dinner and party at the Breeze Bar at Dakulu, right after here. And there are more fun activities going to happen on Saturday. We invite Mr. Lutrot to give us the closing prayer. Um, I think we should all stand. Oh. Yes, please. Almighty Father, ever-living God, we thank you so much for such a fruitful discussion. You've had the privilege of listening to very learned people, and hopefully we can walk out of here with very immense and beneficial knowledge to create the impact that we want to see in our various institutions. As we leave here, we ask for your continuous guidance and mercies as we go to our places of domicile and for those of us who go out as well. We ask all of this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord and personal Savior. Amen. You, you, you can kindly sit down. The bus is yet to come. It's on its way. And it's raining, so you can kindly sit down when it comes. You join.